Here is Andrew, Andrew Winston. Um, as you have heard several times already, Andrew is the uh, co-author of uh, Green to Gold, a very interesting and influential book. Um, he's also the founder of Winston Eco Strategies, works with major companies to implement the kinds of issues we've been talking about right now. And he's also a uh, director of the Corporate Environment Strategy at the School of Forestry and Environment Studies at Yale. Andrew. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, those were very interesting presentations, and I, and I think um, you're going to see a lot of the same themes. When you, when you start to talk about business and sustainability, there's, there's getting to be an understanding out there of what the, the major ideas are. And I hope that in, in Green to Gold, we've, we've laid out some of those. I'm just curious, how many people here have actually read the book? Is there, is there anybody yet? A couple people? Good. Then there's, there's going to be copies out there, so you can, <laughs> you can get some. I'm going to try to stay pretty big picture about the forces that are coming to bear. And let me just start with a little bit of history. Where have companies come from? How do they approach thinking about the environment? I think for many, many years, most companies have thought of the environment as something that's just an expense. It's not an opportunity. It's just something to manage. And it's definitely on the cost side of the ledger. But even this is a, a, an improvement over where we were probably before Earth Day, sort of in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> where the environment was not even just a cost. It was just this invader. And it was, it was completely unwelcome. I think the number of companies that are still in this box are very few now. I think Exxon would love for the environment to go away, but they, but they are now maybe seeing it as a cost. And I think even they're going to get there where they see it as potentially an opportunity. One of the major themes in this whole discussion and, and in, in my book is change. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's over 150 years ago, and it's still true today. It's not the strong or the smart that survive. It's those who can respond to change. And we're facing an unbelievable time of change. The very planet is changing faster than anybody thought possible, right? And that's what we're seeing now. And the environment around business is changing very fast. So that's going to be a theme throughout. And I think you'll hear it all, all during the day. So what's going on out there? I mean, part of the, the question I set out to answer in, in doing this book, a couple key questions. Why are companies doing this? What's the pressure they're under? What's working and, and what isn't? We won't get through all of that today in 15 minutes, but let me just talk about basically why, why is this happening. There's a green wave moving through the business world, and it's, it's just gathered such force in the last few months even, but definitely it's built over the last five, five plus years. And it's fundamentally driven by two forces. One is the very real changes in the natural world. And within that, there's a bunch of things, and I'll touch on them quickly. We're seeing it. You can look out the window and see the changes today. Second, the other big bucket is stakeholders. It's people in all walks of life. It's you and me working as NGOs, as community members, as customers, employees. It's a whole range of things. So what are those environmental problems that, that companies and society have to face? Water issues, drought, and quality. Questions about where we're going to get our energy. And these are the two most controversial ends of the spectrum. It's a whole other topic for another day, but we're going to see nuclear plants again. That's how scary climate change is becoming. You've got environmentalists asking for nuclear plants now. That's, that's where we're at. Land use, biodiversity, loss of species, chemicals and toxins in the environment, in our bodies, and in our children, which not many of you have to deal with yet. But once you have kids, this kind of stuff scares you a lot more than, than it did when it was just you. you. In college, you eat whatever you want. You know, then you start thinking about organic baby food. Once you have a kid, it gets very, a very different discussion. And then finally, of the top five, sort of big five environmental problems, is climate change. Now, this one dwarfs all the rest. This is the conversation of our, of our century, of our time. And, it's, and it drives a lot of the other problems. I've heard companies that fundamentally had some of these other issues in their sites, like biodiversity, if they use um, chemicals in their product or, or particular bio, you know, botanicals. And they're now saying, well, climate change is driving the loss of biodiversity, so we have to focus on that. There's another five that we talk about in the book in sort of a big top ten deforestation, oceans and fisheries, ozone, waste management, and air pollution. Now, is this the exact right 10? No, you know, maybe not. There's 11, there's 12, whatever. These are the big 10 as we see it. Now, is the science absolutely clear? Of course not. It never is. There's probably some scientists in this room, right? Some say it's dangerous, some say it isn't. The problem is we're in this car, and we don't know what we're supposed to do. Are we supposed to go around? Are we supposed to trust this? So the scientific community is never going to be 100%, but we're seeing a change on one issue. Global warming is unequivocal. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 
two months ago, right? February 2nd, 2007. And what's amazing is the study, you know, they're, they're continuing to release results of their, of their, I guess, three or four year study now. The latest statement, just a couple weeks ago, things are happening faster than we expected. How many, is, are, how many people are in science in the room? Does anybody get a scientific degree? How many times have you used the word unequivocal in a paper? <laughs> Never, right? So this, the consensus is pretty remarkable at this point. Now what's interesting is even before the scientific community got to this place, I would say major pockets of the business community had already come to this conclusion. We take the position that the debate is over, we have to deal with greenhouse gases. Now this must be uh, Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's. President of Shell Oil, he's been on a 50 city tour talking about how green they are fundamentally, going to high schools, going to businesses. We have to deal with it. Now what's interesting is the way they talk about it. The debate is over. You're not going to hear many oil companies come out and say, the science is crystal clear, I know global warming is happening, but they now understand that the debate is over. The consensus is out there. And we're seeing interesting other pockets of the business community. Now you would think this was Greenpeace. The planet deserves the benefit of the doubt. That's Rupert Murdoch this past fall. Now he hasn't told his networks quite yet <laughs> how he feels about this. But when he talks about this, it's, again, it's, it's about kids. Remember this, the force of kids. His son runs B Sky B, a cable satellite company, and they've agreed to be climate neutral. His kid obviously got to him. And you're, you see this generationally. So the business community says, hey, climate change is for real. They're going to come around on water, chemicals. It's going to start to happen in the other areas. So what's the other big force? Okay, so if environmental forces, the planet, are becoming clearer to people, the other big force is, is stakeholders. Now this is a view. I, I got my MBA here couple blocks down, the new building had just been built, graduated in 99. Now when you come to business school you hear about Porter's Five Forces or something like that, about the sort of big things that happen to a company. And there's the obvious things, the government, the EPA, the big bad government, your customers, your shareholders, your competitors, maybe your suppliers. Those are the big buckets. Now I think the world is very different today. The forces coming to bear on companies, and we heard about this a little bit in Alan's presentation, are in a lot of different buckets and a lot of different groups. So we, we in the book do 20, and again it could be 22, it could be 19, whatever. And they're of varying power and varying degree, but they're all out there. And the smart companies systematically think about this, have to go through and say, what are these groups asking of us? And what can we tell them about our sustainability? And I'll just touch on the five big buckets really quickly. The first is the rule makers and watchdogs. That's the EPA, that's NGOs, that's the people that have always been there enforcing regulations and asking comp companies tough questions. But it's changing. It used to just be federal. Now we have the EU, as Alan mentioned. We have global with Kyoto and other protocols we're going to see. And we have things happening at the state. Schwarzenegger is, is changing the world. Who would have thought? And I mean, I, was, I just thought it was a joke when he ran for governor. Now he's becoming one of the most impressive progressive governors we've ever seen. Right? He's changing the world. California leads the way. And cities. Over 400 mayors have signed a climate protection agreement saying they're going to take their cities to the Kyoto level of, of uh, emissions. They said, well, Bush didn't sign anything, we're going to sign our own. Second, you've got the agenda setters. The media is the big one. Now, I don't, people may have, you get, you're busy when you're in school, you may not notice what's going on in the newsstand. The last few months have been uh, truly remarkable. Starting just after January, you know, Business Week, imagine a world, all green. This is last year's fortune, there's a fortune this past week as well, I've got to scan that in here. Business of Green a few weeks ago in the New York Times. Business 2.0 a couple months ago. Go green, get rich. Very subtle approach on this one. <laughs> um, I just bought at the newsstand yesterday um, Town and Country magazine cover story, Outside magazine cover story. Um, every magazine is doing a cover story. And my favorite one from a couple weeks ago, Sports Illustrated. Now I have, I have a media background. I used to work at Time Inc. where Sports Illustrated is published. I actually find this sort of humorous, and it's, and it's sort of funny. We've hit a media bubble on this. There is nowhere to go but down. Because if, me, if you're in media, you, you're not going to pitch another cover story on this in the next 6, 12 months. That's it. So we're going to see every cover story. And then, but this article is fascinating to me because they show um, Florida. Now, Al Gore has gotten a lot of heat about the extreme statements about the flooding of Florida in 100 years. Sports Illustrated takes those extreme scenarios as a given in this article and says, in 100 years, this is going to be underwater, and they show all the stadiums now that are going to be underwater, Dolphin Stadium. Now, what's hilarious to me, and I grew up in South Florida, so this is my home, home area. What's hilarious is that if that happens, the stadium's not going to be what we're worried about. 
I think, you know, Miami being gone, say, will be a problem, you know. But what, what's, what I stopped and thought about, first it was ridiculous, then I thought, you know, they're reaching people in something they care about and talking to them in a way that they understand. And this is actually a very good thing. You know, again, we're going to, and they're reaching it, people reading Town and Country, people reading Vogue last year, there was a whole cover thing, or Vanity Fair. Um, you know, it, we're reaching people in different ways. I'll just quickly touch on this. The other part of the agenda setters is academia, people with the ideas. And very quickly, this is a, a, a study of the number of, just the number of articles on endocrine disruptors. One chemical, one issue. So academia, one way to look at it is they give you a leading edge indicator of what some of the issues might be. Now these are not all papers that say that they're a problem or they disrupt hormones, but that shows the level of interest. So if, you, if you're a company, I think you need to look at academia and say, what are they starting to tell us? Because I bet there's a chart like this for lead from 30 or 40 years ago and asbestos from 40 and 50 years ago, and it builds. So you know that the discussion is happening, and this may get banned. We're going to see more and more. I mean, mercury is going to disappear from our society. We're going to hit a number of elements that we're going to take out of production. And, it's, and there's always going to be this kind of chart. So if a company doesn't see this coming, it's because they're not looking to the, to the stakeholders and listening to them. OK. We're going to go through those again very quickly. Yeah, there's a polar bear. He's sad. Things are unequivocal. Rupert Murdoch, who, who knew? OK. Um, lots of media, lots of coverage, academia. All right. Business community, third big bucket, by far the most interesting because this is where business asks business some tough questions. Same day as the IPCC report that said it's unequivocal, this article was buried halfway through the journal. And I do actually read the journal because I believe the audiences, the business audiences I talk to will believe me more when I can quote the journal. Their editorial page is just still, frankly, off the deep end on climate change. But their business coverage is actually pretty on board. It's, it's sort of fascinating. It's like they can't let go of believing that this must be some Al Gore conspiracy when they get their op-eds together. But then they cover what's going on daily. There is a green business story in the journal every day. This is buried halfway through the journal. This is the most important story business, green business story I've ever seen, and potentially one of the most important stories we're ever going to see. And here's why. Walmart, in this article, had started to ask its suppliers to use less non-renewable energy. Stop and think about that for a second. Walmart represents about 2% of the US GDP. Stop and think about that for a second. That's a shocking number. We haven't seen that kind of scale of a company since GM in the, in the 50s. And this is in a global world, so that's pretty impressive. So when they ask their suppliers, what percentage of the global economy is represented by their supplier base? I don't know the number. Nobody's calculated it, but let's call it 10%. GE is a supplier. They sell them light bulbs. P&G. Let's call it 10%. That's a four to five trillion dollar economy. That's suppliers that are now being asked to reduce their renewable, their non-renewable energy use. This is going to do far more than any Kyoto Agreement, any global accord. It's going to take governments around the world much longer than actually just greening the supply chain. This is changing the world. I was at their quarterly sustainability meeting a few weeks ago. They mean it. They're serious. And it's happening. And the companies that don't understand this are, are going to be in very big trouble very soon. Because we're going to see a day where shelf space in Walmart goes to the most sustainable products. It's going to happen. Another group that you guys would recognize, students, communities, the protesters, this big bucket, not really much to say. But, but for companies, one important stakeholder group is employees. It's these people when they go to work. And it's driving behavior. And we heard that already about interface. And that's a, it's a truism. And fifth is the most interesting bucket in a lot of ways. The, and we heard about this from Alan. The, the risk assessors, the investors and risk assessors, the insurance companies, Swiss Re, the shareholders, the capital markets, the banks. And I could talk about this for a, a long time. There's a story in the last few weeks about the utility TXU in Texas. I won't go into the details, but fundamentally private equity guys have said green matters. These are the most short term of Wall Street. Wall Street is starting to get it. It's a big change. But this is also a chart that I love to show, which is the amount of money in venture capital out west. They only care about making money. They're not going green for, for no reason. And in our book, we only had the numbers through 05, and it looked pretty good. 10% of venture capital money going to clean tech. Now it's up to 14%. That's a lot of money. There are big people involved in this. Underlying these, this green wave are tectonic shifts, these big mega forces that make the green wave even stronger. These are things like globalization, the, the Thomas Friedman, world is flat kind of stuff, technology. But one of my, you know, the rise of the middle class consumer in China and India. They want our, our lifestyle. We have no right to tell anybody not to have it. 
There's going to be hundreds of millions of middle class people in those countries soon. We don't have enough earth. So this is a big deal. But one of my favorite and, and interesting forces is related, I think, to this guy. Do you know him? You're going to forget him quickly. Senator George Allen of Virginia, former senator. His little racial misstep, the video that was captured on YouTube, gave the Senate to the Democrats. This was, this was one of the important races that changed by just thousands of votes. This is a story of transparency. I want you to remember, we heard about this already, transparency. This is the force that's going to drive so much business behavior over the next generation. Everything you do, write, I am, Representative Mark Foley. Anything you do in print, whatever, can be made available instantly everywhere. It's no longer about what you do being, you know, they always, they always say, you know, I don't want to do anything unless I'm comfortable with it being on the front page of the paper. That's quaint. Now it's, you have to do something thinking that it could be made available to anyone in the world instantly. And this is the world we're facing. So this is what Wired picked up this, this month. They call it radical transparency. I love this phrase. They talk about CEOs blogging. Microsoft was going around with videos and talking about their development process. This was secret stuff until recently. Now it's becoming public knowledge. So where does this leave us? <laughs> now with an audience this young, I, I pray that you actually know who this is. I usually, I, when I was in Europe for the book, I, I spoke to a bunch of executives in Shell. And they used a t an acronym, TINA. So I use this as a, as a way. They're not talking about, about this TINA. For those of you born in the 80s, this is TINA Turner. <laughs> there is no alternative. This is no, there's no choice anymore. And this is the message. I, I spoke to a, a bunch of natural gas companies, all guys from Texas a couple weeks ago. This is the most skeptical audience that's ever going to ask me to come talk. There's more skeptical audiences, but they will never ask me. And I told them this. This is not a choice anymore. And they said, is, you think coal's going to roll over or they're just going to disappear? You, know, and you can have a lot of debates about where things are going to head, but there's no choice. You've got to deal with climate change. You've got to deal with biodiversity if you're shell. They're talking about going into new lands. They want to dig for the energy that we need because we still need it but they have to worry about these environmental problems. They have a director of biodiversity now. They never would have thought of that five, ten years ago. So let me just touch very quickly on some of the main elements in the book. How are companies creating value in this world? There's four big buckets that, that we see. Two of them are about reducing the downsides to the business, cutting costs and risk. Now this is where most of the environmental discussion for years and years has been, and it's still very important. But the upside is where there's so much excitement now for companies. Every company has a, has a growth goal. We're going to grow. We've got to tell Wall Street we're growing. So they want to find ways to grow revenues. And there's a fourth bucket, intangibles. And if we had time, I'd talk about GE in this. And we may hear a little bit about that from Nick, I'm guessing. Building your brand value on being green. Now, when people talk about innovation, a big theme in, in, in my work and in the book was innovation. People think about revenues mostly, creating new products, driving new revenues. But I think all of these areas are innovative. The companies that are leading in any one of these are finding ways to be innovative. And let me just touch on a couple very quickly. In cost cutting, 3M, for people who know this field, know this is the standard story. They've been doing this thing called pollution prevention pays for 30 years or more. They've saved over a billion dollars easily. That's a very conservative estimate. And it's innovative. They find innovative ways to cut resource use throughout their operations. So let me turn to the upside really briefly, the Prius. This is the red Prius. This is not mine, but I have this exact model. It's a very cool car. Does anybody have one? Well, that's the first time I've done this in a long time where nobody raised their hand. That's amazing. I guess you guys don't have cars, do you? <laughs> you live, you live in, I just moved out of New York City last fall, and I had never owned a car until my, my late 30s, which I'll admit to, um, and uh, had never needed one. But this is the first car I got. Uh, it's a great car. Now, what's the, the story here for business, as we started to hear before, is that it's, it's the most successful eco product of all time. And I say that without any qualms. And the reason is this. It's not how many they've sold, because until recently it was not a top 10 car. It was a few percentage points of their sales. And they maybe didn't make much money on it, but it was the halo it put around the whole company. They were known as innovative. Their competitors knew they were innovative. The Wall Street Journal picked up on it in a story in the fall about how innovative the company is. It gave them this brand value, and they've sold more of every kind of car because of it. When you see any article about the dominance of Toyota as they become the biggest car company in the world this year, they always mention the Prius. And where has this left things? Fourth quarter profits reported um, almost two months ago. Toyota, almost $4 billion. Ford lost $6 billion in the same time frame. Detroit's in a lot of trouble. And the, the 
article in the New York Times talked about a yawning lead. That's just a phrase you don't want to see about your competitor. A <laughs> yawning lead. Growing dominance, most evident in new fuel technologies. This is what it's about. Relentlessly closer to the number one. I mean, these are tough words. So this is where we're headed. So the, the question I'll just pose towards the end here is, why aren't there more green products? Why aren't there more green companies? There's so much value. There's four buckets. Why isn't this easier? Well, the obvious answer is there's a lot of hurdles. And one of the things we do in the book, which is available out there, uh, <laughs> is describe that this is not always win-win. That's been the discussion for so many years, that if you take on environmental thinking, you profit. Certainly there's value, but it's not easy. It's, it's in fact, not only as hard as other forms of business strategy, it's probably harder because it's tougher to make the case and tangible values are tough to put numbers on. This is challenging. Let me just touch briefly on one example. And there's a, there's a chapter on failures. One is the, what, what we call the middle management squeeze because I know one of the themes today is why is there not more adoption or how do we get to a greater adoption? The best example is BP in this, refinery managers. The, the CEO, Lord John Brown in the late 90s said climate change is real. He was a leader, way ahead of the curve. He told his refinery managers they had to cut. They had to cut emissions across the board. The problem was these guys, pretty senior guys who run a factory, still had their other goals. They had to cut costs. They had, they had throughput goals. They had quality goals. Now they had to cut emissions too. These things don't mesh all the time. And one senior executive said, we created a tension between business performance and environmental goals. A tension between business performance and environmental goals. And I think if you substitute safety in for environmental in that sentence, you have a sense of what happened to BP in the US in the last couple of years. There was a big explosion in Texas a couple years ago. And this is not something I just made up, said there's this tension. The Wall Street Journal reported, and they did two articles a few months apart that were almost the exact same article. Executives worried that cuts contributed to the blast. The refinery manager said he had been ordered to cut costs 25%. Now he's covering his behind a little bit, but this is exactly what happens in every company. If you've ever worked in a company, had P&L responsibility, you get told a bunch of things and they don't always mesh. Now BP, the solution in part was to relieve them from the environmental goals and say you produce as much as you can in your refinery and your emissions per unit will go down. You'll be more efficient, we'll find the cuts elsewhere in the system. But it's, it's, it's a challenge. So how do you get over these hurdles? In the book we talk about a toolkit, at the core is a mindset, and you've heard some inklings of that in my discussion. A broad value chain perspective, we heard a lot about that, Interface is a king of this. Um, thinking long term. Lots of things about the mindset, tracking your business, developing a culture, and redesigning your products, your business, your supply chain. I'll just end with one quick story. Um, 37 years ago this week, three astronauts climbed into this capsule, Apollo 13. Now people probably saw the Tom Hanks movie, even if you weren't around for the, for the actual event. 200,000 miles from Earth, oxygen tank exploded. There's that damage you see on the capsule. Now, the, I use this in the book as an example. We call it the Apollo 13 principle. Now, what happened was Gene, uh, Gene Kranz, the flight director, put guys in a room and gave them equipment and said, okay, the guys back in this capsule, there's three of them in a capsule that's meant for two guys, and they have to last two more days than it was meant to. We can't clean the air. They're going to they're gonna asphyxiate. So they gave them the equipment and said, find a way to cleanse the air given what they have on board. And he said later, failure is not an option. So this is a principle that we talk about in the mindset. No is not an option. It's the genius of and instead of or. The CEO of, of Walmart a couple weeks ago told, his, told everyone at the end of a four-hour meeting on sustainability that he sat through attentively. He said, we want to create products that are affordable. We want to sell products that are affordable and sustainable, and not or. Now, this is the challenge we have. And today, for all of us, it's not about bringing home a small ship with three people, but a much larger one with seven billion. So I end it there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Let me remind you again, the book is outside. <laughs> this is about business, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Shameless, Shameless, exactly, right. Yeah. So finally, our last speaker is Nicholas Eisenberger. Nicholas is the managing principal of Green Order. Uh, prior to that, he was the CEO of Ecos Technologies, which provides environmental health and safety uh, management services. Uh, he started and run a number of environmental enterprises in North America. Uh, he, by training, I guess he's a lawyer and practiced as an environmental lawyer for a period with a law degree from Harvard, and worked in the venture capital area, where he was running a clean tech venture capital firm at Churchill Capital, which at the time was, I think, one of the largest uh, green private equity firms in the country. Nick. First of all, I want to really thank all the speakers uh, so far, and Jeff for um, the 
the setting the stage here on all these issues. I think you guys have all done a wonderful job of seeing the market the way I see it. So I'm going to try to push the boundaries a little bit. I'm going to give you a very, very quick perspective on who we are as a company because maybe there's some value to you um, in sort of looking at this through the lens, a commercial lens. We have uh, a, a company um, interface and the journey that they've taken. We've got um, Andrew and his book and uh, the study that they've done and the lessons that they've gleaned and, and articulated in uh, Green to Gold. Um, we've got Alan and his many years of experience at the government. So I'm going to give you a slightly different take of uh, a professional services firm that's trying to help companies navigate um, these areas. Then I'm going to try to be a little bit pr provocative and look at what's coming next. So Green Order uh, is a uh, sustainability strategy and marketing firm. Um, and uh, we really, our tagline is making progress profitable. And we really believe passionately that those two things um, should go together. Uh, and that's what we're working to achieve. We bring three core competencies to uh, everything that we do. Um, first of all, there's the strategy perspective, uh, really helping to look at this from a bottom line business perspective. How do you create uh, business value by investing in green? The second one is a technical perspective, and we believe that environmental issues are very technical issues, and you can't develop strategies unless you have good gr grasp of the facts, and so we um, really try to uh, bring that uh, to bear on every engagement that we work on. We have folks with environmental engineering degrees, et cetera, on our, uh, our team. The third one, though, is the, is the marketing and the communications. Uh, in this area, we found that a lot of the value, uh, a lot of the challenge, and ultimately a lot of the value of investing in green is in how do you tell your story effectively and credibly. And a lot of people don't know how to do that well. Uh, they're either afraid of doing it or they're overly confident that they can do it. Um, and so we found that together, these three perspectives are really essential for navigating this new territory. These are just some of the uh, companies we've been very fortunate to uh, work with over the last couple of years. Uh, we have a bunch of partners. We feel we are part of an ecosystem and some of the ma mainstream firms that work on these issues, we work with them. Um, and we're proud of the results we've delivered. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the first one here, uh, working with GE. Is, Andrew noted, um, we've been working with them for almost three years on the de design and development of their eco-imagination initiative, and I'll, I'll give you a little case study there. So you've heard this from all the other speakers so far. Uh, there is uh, this uh, progression that we are witnessing, um, and I've been in this space for 15 years. Uh, it's really been my focus for most of my professional career. I've never seen the kind of attention that we're seeing now. Um, and we've, we've come from, uh, you know, in 1970, in the wake of Silent Spring and, and other things of that nature, uh, Congress finally said, uh, wow, there's a, a popular outcry here to do something, and thou shalt not pollute. We know that there are technologies out there that you can be using, um, and you, you must use them. And so that was a very compliance focus, and uh, companies took them a little while, but eventually they got that down. And then uh, they, uh, they understood through that process that you could reduce further risks uh, if you were to be proactive. Uh, and then in the 80s and 90s, there was this focus on, wow, you know, th th there's some benefits, or actual business benefits of doing this in, in terms of cutting costs, being more efficient. And folks started to say, hey, we're better at this than our competitors. We're, we're really good at looking for efficiencies in our business. But, but what we're seeing today, and which is very encouraging, I think, is, is we're, we're moving towards the other side of this. And businesses are finally looking at this as a real source of business value. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, we've all noted this. You, all you have to do is open up the paper or read a magazine and you see um, that there's this new green lifestyle emerging. And that is one where uh, I think that the distinction is you had, if you go back to the 60s again, um, um, this idea of uh, there was a better way um, but here we are in the 21st century, um, and I think it's more, no, we want to have our cake and eat it too a little bit. Um, we want to be greener, but we also don't want to sacrifice performance or pay more, uh, although there are exceptions. Um, uh, we, we want to get the things that we want, and we want it to be um, uh, more consistent with the kind of world we want to live in. So some of the data that you've all seen about how this is playing out popularly, and speaking to the new green, this idea that uh, we had some of these early 
uh, pioneers in sustainability, and they were more of that, shall we say, crunchy ilk, uh, the, the Patagonias, the Ben and Jerry's, the Body Shop. Um, but now you're seeing BP and Walmart and Dell and many mainstream companies jumping into this, and it's a, it's a much more mainstream focus on this issue, which again is very encouraging. Some examples, automotive. One of the things I like to say, uh, and you know, the Prius obviously very much led here. I think the interesting thing is that Toyota didn't really come out of the box with the Prius um, a, as an environmental product. It really was more of a, a technology, a design. It was really designed for those f folks who like gadgets, you know, um, and that's the way they positioned it. And yes, it was environmental, more efficient too. Now, of course, the public imagination has caught on more to the environmental component, but I don't think that might have, wouldn't have happened if it was just a plain Jane looking car. I think the full package is what has, has made this catch a fire. Um, and that was very sad. I don't know uh, if they did that on purpose, um, but I think it was very savvy for them to not overly emphasize the environmental components, that it was part of an overall package. Now you have this moving upstream into the luxury market with uh, folks like Lexus and the Tesla. I don't know if you're familiar with that. An all electric, uh, very expensive sport car. It can go from zero to 100 in like 4.4 seconds. Um, and even GM, who's another client of ours, uh, has been getting in the game. They, they really recognize that they've been left behind by Toyota and they're trying to figure out how they can embed um, environmental advantages into what they have to offer the market and one of their existing strengths uh, which they're trying to build on is in this area of flex fuel technologies. I like to say, and I hope it's true, although I saw a slightly discouraging article in the New York Times last week, I, I do believe that we will see more change in the automobile in the next five years than we have seen in our entire lifetime. And that's uh, finally, right? Um, although, and this gets to what I'm going to try to address at the end, I think um, I saw an article in the New York Times that said, in fact, the responsiveness of the public to increases in uh, the price of gas is going down. So what does that mean? What's that going to, how's that going to play out? Fashion, organic food, the whole, wa whole Foods experience. I went to a uh, opening of the new Whole Foods on the Bowery last week and they had this gala opening. Gala opening for a supermarket? <laughs> And to get in, you had to donate $25 to Riverkeeper. Uh, and there must have been 2,000 people there who had donated $25. And of course, RFK Jr., who uh, plays a big role at Riverkeeper and protecting the Hudson, uh, was sort of the MC for the evening. And it was this, you know, there were no local residents at this uh, thing. This was all cocktail dresses and, you know, and there's, some, there's an excessiveness to that. But um, I think all of us who have been working on this field for as long as we have are you know, willing to kind of let that happen for a little bit. But again, I want to talk about the implications of that. One of the things that we've learned in our work is um, uh, the importance of relevance. So um, Dell, Michael Dell came out a couple months ago and said, for every computer that you buy, for every Dell computer you buy, we're going to donate one to two dollars to plant a tree to combat climate change. And on the one hand, I thought, well, that's great. You have one of the most prominent uh, executives in the uh, uh, computer field saying that climate change is an issue and we, we're going to stand, put our money where our mouth is and try to do something about it. That's great. On the other hand, I said, I don't go to a store and buy a computer and think about trees, right? If he had said, we're going to donate a dollar, we're going to invest a dollar or two in R&D to make our computers more efficient and we're going to share that knowledge with the industry, then I would have been really impressed. Because I do think about energy consumption. I do think about how long my battery lasts. I do think about the issues like that when I buy a computer. So relevance, I think, is really uh, important. And a lot of people are sort of doing these me too things, just trying to get out there with something because of the focus on green and uh, saying, you know, well, let's plant a tree. Um, the method, you may have heard of the method. This is a disruptive product. I have a couple clients in the consumer products area and they're all very focused on this, equally as with Walmart, who they sell many of most uh, a high percentage of their products through. Um, somebody came out and, uh, just to start up and said, we have a better way. We're going to give you a concentrate, a low package concentrate, and uh, it's a bet. It's not uh, it, it's a perfect example of green not being less but more, right? And I think that difference between the idea of sacrifice 
that we used to associate with green, and in some cases still. How many people think about um, recycled content toilet paper and get all <laughs> excited? Or recycled uh, copy paper. Do you think that's really going to have the brightest, most vibrant colors? Probably not. So I think that that idea that green is less is still lingering very much. And it's products like these and the Prius and others that are going to help combat that. And once that, once we've lost that kind of assumption that green is less, I think we'll make even more progress than we have today. And I think Interface is a great example of a company that's done a good job with that. So why this change? We've talked a lot about this. I think uh, Andrew mentioned transparency. That's a huge issue. Um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of these sort of chaotic tipping point factors, a whole bunch of things accumulating in a nonlinear way to affect the public's uh, perception of what's really going on around them. It's Katrina. It's, it's a war in the Middle East. It's gas prices. It's, as Andrew said, looking out the window and saying, huh, it's January 7th and people are walking by in shorts. That's weird. That happened this year. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, just very quickly, what's our approach? How do, what, what, how do we help, try to help companies navigate through this? We um, say that environmental marketing, environmental strategies got to have cred, which is just a, you know, a memory device. Uh, and it's really marketing 101. There's nothing, uh, there's no rocket science about this. But it has to have credibility. You have to be able to uh, back up what you're saying with data. It's got to be relevant. I've talked about that already in the, in the Dell example. Effective messaging. I can't tell you how important this is. So many companies get are, are engineering-based companies, and they just can't say something simply. They don't know how to do it. It's not in their DNA. So they want to, I had a client who actually invited us to come up to their headquarters, and they scheduled eight hours, and they took us through a series of rooms where each wall of the room was covered with data about all the good things they were doing in the environment. And they said, see? <laughs> and I said, your customer doesn't have eight hours to walk through your rooms. You can't do that. Still don't get it. So effective mes messaging, a simple message. Differentiation, again, this goes to this issue of me tooism and how do you come out with something that is authentic to your company, your environment, your organization, if it's not a commercial context, whatever it is, how do you, how do you bring something that really speaks to who you are and is going to speak to your, what your customer is looking for from you. So uh, just to really very quickly, uh, eco-imagination. Uh, uh, we were very fortunate to uh, work with the chief marketing officer of GE um, and the senior leadership team over the last couple years on helping them design and develop eco-imagination. And what is eco-imagination? It's really uh, GE's um, commitment to do four things. One is they're going to double their uh, investment in research and development in environmentally advanced products um, from, to 1.5 billion by 2010. So that's 1.5 billion dollars a year in R&D. The second one is they're going to uh, shoot to double their revenue from these kinds of products to 20 billion by 2010. 20 billion, uh, just for some context, you know, GE today is about 160 billion dollars a year in revenue, so it's not the biggest proportion of their revenues is still a minority proportion, but it's not immaterial either. Um, so it's a very, very bottom line or top line really oriented initiative. The, the third is, uh, sorry, the fourth is to report on what they're doing publicly, going to this transparency issue. That was it. That's eco-imagination. Um, but to get there, it was a long journey for GE. Um, you had a company that had um, Overall, a great reputation with Americans. It's been around for 100 years, founded by or an outgrowth of the efforts of Thomas Edison. Um, and you know, the general public would look at GE and say it's a great reputation. On the other hand, on the environmental front, a lot of concerns about legacy issues with Hudson and the things that they had done there and elsewhere. And the environmental folks, they actually have a staff of 1,000 people focused on environment, health, and safety, did not want to be out there in the market touting their environmental performance because they were very fearful of, of getting attacked for doing so. Um, and 
So we, uh, Jeff Immelt really had the inspiration behind this. He, he, he recognized that there was something that was happening. There was a trend. The company was a leader in many markets of the, having the most environmentally advanced or energy efficient products. They hadn't done this on purpose. So if they hadn't done it on purpose, it must have been, there must be a reason. The customer was starting to ask for it. And what could they do about this to get more credit for what they were doing? And, the, and their first thought was a little bit more, well, let's do something sort of to be socially responsible. Let's talk about how we're being socially responsible. And, w and I think one of the things we're most proud of is, is really helping them say that, that, that nobody would believe them. Right? Nobody's going to believe if GE says, out of the goodness of our hearts, we want to you know, do something that's nice to the planet. That's just not authentic to GE. But this idea that green is green, that we're doing this because we see there's a real growth initiative here, that it's essential to our winning in the marketplace in the future, that people would believe. And um, that's the way they're going about it. So I don't need to spend any time on this. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time focusing on uh, building credibility around the initiative and developing what we call scorecards to do a quantitative, uh, really intensive analysis of each product that was included in the initiative so that if anybody ever asked, um, well, what do you mean when you say yours, your product is better in this area, your light bulbs or your aircraft engine or your uh, locomotive or what have you, and they can say, well, what we mean is X. And they've, they've been, uh, you know, I think one of the things that is interesting about the GE example is that it's, you know, you had BP and they came out early and said, we're going to look beyond petroleum. And I think that was a watershed. Um, but in some ways, a little bit more predictable that one of the oil majors would eventually say, we want to be different. And we want to um, look to say that we're the ones that are looking to the future. And BP, as we all know, have had some challenges recently. I think the thing about GE that, that we found most interesting in being involved in it and continue today is that you have this conglomerate that has all these different businesses. And it straddles the economy. And, and yet it still sees that um, its future lies in making a big bet in this area. So I think that's something that has made a lot of companies that aren't oil companies wake up and you have a lot of CEOs saying, wow, if Jeff Immelt's doing this, I need to think about this. Okay, so this goes, I think a lot, you guys covered a lot of this already and I think what's nice is a lot of consistency here um, in terms of the lessons that we've learned and what we see in the market in terms of how this can be pushed um, how do you approach these issues? So uh, make green a, a unique differentiator. Uh, always twin environmental benefits with other benefits that the customer or the constituency or the stakeholder is looking for. Don't create a green, a green ghetto. It's not a side thing. It's a central thing. Um, look at it as a top line growth opportunity. And again, if, whether this is a commercial context or you're talking about a nonprofit or a government, align it with your core organizational goals. It's not just PR, it's about strategy. And another thing that we say is sustainability for its own sake is not sustainable. We don't want to see uh, green under every rock. If it doesn't make sense for your organization to invest in this, there's not always a win-win. You do have to be extremely disciplined in looking at where there will be a payoff by investing in green. Next thing is I think both top-down, and I think somebody already said this, both top-down and bottom-up are extremely important. Um, you need that leadership. People look to leaders to set the course, uh, and if it's not there, it's not going to go anywhere. This whole idea of the environmental health and safety folks, this, the, the general council has got this all covered. Who cares? I mean, you know, you don't have the, they're not, general counsel aren't movie stars. They're not, nobody's, better worse, I'm a lawyer, nobody really cares. <laughs> um, but, but, if, if, but if the CEO uh, or other leaders in the organization are behind this, then a lot more people are going to uh, pay attention. On the other hand, that alone isn't enough. If you don't have the folks in the organization who are out there with a the customer, designing the products, developing the products, um, uh, who, who see that this is aligned with their business, that they have the incentive, you're not going to make any progress either. So finally, I think it's about the customer, it's about the product, um, and uh, um, you really need to engage with folks. So I just want to say, uh, by way of closing, a couple of things that hopefully you know, can be a good lead-in for uh, the panel discussion. One of the things that I'm passionate about is, uh, and I've spent, I, I had a revelation one day. I was walking down the street in 1992, and I was working on environmental uh, issues, and I was going to be, go to Harvard Law School the next year, and I was offered a job at the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and I walked away, and I was walking down the street, and I said, wow, I was just offered a job at one of the best uh, legal 
and environmental league organizations in the world. I don't want that job. I don't really want to use the tools of the law to tear things down, as important as it is, and I'm glad there are people out there who are doing it. I want to build things up. I want to try to be an environmental entrepreneur. I have no idea what that means right now, but that's what I want to try to do. So I've been very passionate about the idea for a long time that the market's the most powerful force on earth right now, for better or for worse. And um, uh, if you can harness that and demonstrate to the market that there is an upside in this, you will drive tremendous change. And I still believe in that passionately, and that what, that's what Green Order is, that idea is, is, is what we're built around. However, speaking to what Alan said, I think that things are swinging a little bit. And, I mean, it's no question that from 1992, Rio, to uh, 2002, Joe Berg, that, that corporations are in the driver, driver's seat. There's no question that when you look at the, three, uh, the four presentations that we've given you today, that corporations remain in the driver's seat, okay, and companies and entrepreneurial activity. And I think that's great. But I think we need to start thinking about what role will government play and can it play uh, in light of the fact that uh, companies and private commerce is so firmly in the driver's seat now, uh, and people are recognizing that, well, what, what supporting role, uh, furthering role can government play? Because in my opinion, no, no disrespect to all the hardworking uh, people at, at, uh, uh, in environmental policy positions, it's been very quiet, and there's been a number of factors that, but in the last 10 years, not much has happened. So I actually am predicting a little bit of a comeback for the government and for policy. And I'm interested in seeing how that will play out. The, the other thing is, um, I think, you know, and Andrew alluded to this, um, this idea of, of the hype. Um, so uh, clearly we're at a tipping point, and uh, we've gone down the other side. The scale has tipped uh, in the public imagination. I didn't think it would happen as if you asked me last October, would the United States um, buy into climate change just five months ago? I would have said, maybe, but I'm not sure when. Happened, December, January, done. So uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that we're probably hitting the high water mark. This is not going to last forever. This won't be the focus of everybody's, um, uh, you know, every magazine forever. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is what comes next? If you look at what happened post uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and post the internet and the dot-com bust, I think it, 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 the, the high water mark receded, um, but the world has changed. And um, uh, I think that's going to happen here, too. So I kind of think it's going to be less hype, more impact down the road. And I think that's great, because it'll just be a part of the way uh, people do everything they do. And, and I'll just say, at the end of the day, I think we have um, uh, the thing that makes me most optimistic is we, have tremend we haven't even begun to tap the ways that we can improve things. Um, if you look at, I have this here. This is my, this is my briefcase. It's a solar-powered. Briefcase, and uh, that you know I'm so cool, um, <laughs> but but uh, I, I've gotten pulled over in the street by cops. You know, hey, come here, what is that thing? Um, <laughs> but they're excited about it when they hear about it. the TSA. They love it. You think that I'm gonna, they, you think they think I'm a bomber? But no, they love it. But the point is, I can take my cell phone off the grid. I can plug in my BlackBerry at night on that thing. That's what I do with it. That's just one of a million ways people are coming up with tiles where you walk on them and they generate electricity. Right? Somebody I've heard about t t using turnstiles to generate electricity. I mean, we haven't even begun to tap. So I guess what I'm saying is that I think the most optimistic thing I can say is that we're at the end of the beginning and not the beginning of the end. I think what I'd like to do is actually sort of turn this over to questions from the audience immediately rather than take any further discussion with the panel. If you guys have been sitting very patiently and very interestedly a chance to take part in this and uh, put your own voice in it. Uh, so, it's open to the audience. Questions uh, for the panel? Comments on issues that the panels of right panel have raised? Um, yes. Okay, hi. Um, I have one question. It is about the decision of the Supreme Court on the EPA saying that they were going to they were to have the authority to regulate CO2 emissions. And the, I don't know if anybody can hear me anymore. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Just and uh, I just want to know how that's going to impact the auto industry. So, I mean, somebody talked about, you know, we're going to have to see big changes in five years, but how is that actually going to, to impact not only the car industry, but if that's going to spill over to other industries? Can I go first? Sure. Uh, well, you know, um, GM is a client I can't obviously talk to uh, their specific issues, but I just, I, I think that the, uh, the, 
import of this decision is more symbolic than it is practical. Um, I think there's a societal or a uh, uh, United States uh, society question about how do we want to approach this that's going to require the input of many, many different actors, um, most particularly through the lens of Congress. Um, I think, uh, you know, the presidential candidates are, are relatively aligned around um, doing something, um, but it's really going to play out, I think, in Congress um, with the input of many stakeholders and business. But at the auto industry in particular, um, I think it's going to actually make it a little easier for them to um, to uh, turn the attention towards uh, cap and trade and away from cafe. Uh, and that might be healthy. I mean, there's, it's, it's such a juggernaut around cafe standards that um, we've made no progress for years on that. And so maybe changing the conversation might actually uh, get us there farther. That's debatable, but I think, I think that's what I see. No, I agree. It's a very... Uh significant uh, decision in terms of elevating the issue. Uh, those of us in, uh, uh, in EP, I don't know if you could read the Washington uh, uh, Post, but there was a cartoon yesterday. It showed the EPA on fire. <laughs> and uh, somebody answering the phone, hello? Yes? This uh, call from the Supreme Court. What? Where? <laughs> Hangs up and he says, crank call. Um, <laughs> so I think it, it is, it elevates the issue. Uh, I don't like to see the agency put in the, in the, in the negative sense because uh, really though EPA is at the center, it's a, a decision that's uh, um, broad to public policy. And what's going to happen is the, is the administration has to uh, assess it. What the Supreme Court did was basically remanded back to EPA. Uh, which means remanding it back to the administration and that debate will go on. But it just falls in line with all the other um, signs that the issue is serious, that uh, we have authority to deal with it, and that we have to find the right policy approaches. Let me give, give you one, one more uh, viewpoint on that. Um, and it's coming from a, a company, you know, we're Fortune 1000, but we probably will not be regulated. We're, we're not going to be large enough. Um, but we still play in the carbon markets in a big way. And where that impacts us is, you know, I think you know, we mentioned the debates over, I agree the debates over, there will be some sort of legislation, cap and trade, and there are other mechanisms that we support. But when that happens and the big boys get involved, what's that going to do to our ability to get offsets, right? So in 2003, we're buying 70,000 tons of offset. In 07, we'll probably buy over 700,000 tons of offsets. We have a climate neutral product. Most of all of our products within the North American region are all climate neutral now in 07. So for us strategically what that means is we have to play a big role in the carbon markets. We need to understand them. We need to be involved in developing the standards. We sit on the Voluntary Carbon Standard Board. We need to be involved in defining what it means to be climate neutral. Uh, we need to work on mechanisms like derivatives and forward trading and things with investment banks, which we're doing. So that's a whole strategic measure for us of what you know, legislation will mean. We have, you know, we have to protect ourselves. It's a little different perspective. I, I just add two quick points. I think the, the decision is both sweeping and important, but in some sense late. Um, I think they're already being overtaken by events. And let me just point to one story yesterday in the journal. The cover story was that the second largest oil field in the world, in the Gulf of Mexico, had lost 20% of its volume in the last year and was projected to lose 30% more over the next couple of years. We're hitting peak oil. We're running out of oil. It's, it's just happening now. And when I talked to oil companies during the research of the book, they quietly said, yeah, peak oil 20, 2009, 2010. Um, they don't really debate it. So I actually think that the auto emissions and cars are going to be regulated by market forces. The price of oil is going to only be basically higher, higher, and thus people are going to demand more fuel-efficient cars. I mean, it's happening anyway. So by the time we get a regulation in place, I think we're going to see in that sector a uh, change is going to happen much faster. The other thing I'll say is that the auto companies are going to continue now, even more so, pushing what they've been doing, which is lobbying that they shouldn't be uh, pressured alone as the only sector. And they're going to push for an economy-wide solution. And this is predictable, but it's actually a very good thing. Because if we have a cap and trade system or something that just takes one sector, it will fail. So it's a good thing in some sense if, if one sector goes points at the other and then they point back and they all point at each other and we'll end up with a full system. And I think, I think that's a good thing. Lady here. There's a microphone back there. 
Do you want to stand up there? <laughs> Hello. Um, you've all done a great job explaining how manufacturers and retailers have integrated sustainability into their practices. Can you talk a little bit about um, the processes that that happen to either procure the raw materials or transport those goods and in, in the um, goods movement and transportation sector, commercial transportation sector, what direction do you see sustainability be integrated into, into practices of a lot of companies that we can't identify brands with because we, we're, they're not consumer companies or even if they're business to business companies, they're really way up the supply chain because um, that, that can affect a lot of um, issues with global warming, and I think we touched upon a little bit about the, the emissions trading, but what, what direction do you see sustainability being integrated into that part of the, of the, of the picture? Well, let me, let me start. I'll give you an example that we're working on. Um, we've all mentioned Walmart many times today. Well, Walmart has about 14 uh, working groups working with them on various aspects of their uh, sustainability 360 degree. That's what the CEO now calls it Sustainability 360. And I was at a meeting uh, recently and discovered uh, from a colleague at Unilever that EPA was on the working groups. I said, what? Which working groups? And then I found out that we were involved in eight of the 14 working groups. And I was very excited about that because uh, I didn't know about it, but I got all eight, all of the people together and they didn't even know that they, their colleagues were involved in the working groups. And what we discovered was that um, uh, across EPA and different program offices, we've been working with them on a range of issues that go from how can Walmart, which has I think the largest shipping fleet or automobile fleet in the world, improve their fleet uh, capabilities. And they're using EPA models in some of our auto programs to calculate the efficiency of delivery systems, what miles to run the trucks at, and so on and so forth. Another one is working on packaging. Another one's working on the products. You know, 